Keep a stiff upper lip, or stay calm and carry on. Slogans that might describe the British civilian wartime spirit. Civilians living under a rain of German bombs. But was it really so? And was the response to the Blitz specifically British? The answer to both questions is no. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In our weekly episodes about World War II, covering the London Blitz and the War Against Humanity episode about the use and effects of strategic bombing, we have already mentioned that Churchill, as well as Hitler, Mussolini, and other contemporary leaders, democratic, fascist, or otherwise, were fascinated by the idea of crushing the enemy's morale by destroying civilian homes, shops, completely disrupting life. That idea is largely based on the theory of one man, Gustave Le Bon. In his Psychologie des Foules, The Psychology of the Masses, Le Bon theorized in 1895 that human societies, with all their rules, morals, and values, crumble in times of terror. Humans will descend a few steps on the staircase of civilization, was his idea. This dark view of the human psyche proved to be largely influential. They all read it. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt. But did morale crumble and did societies collapse? One of Churchill's most important advisors and close friends, scientist Frederick Lindemann, was a huge advocate of bombing Germany to smithereens to crush their morale. We will definitely get back to this in a later episode, but what is interesting here is that he had a survey done in Birmingham and Hull, two British cities affected by strategic bombing. One of Lindemann's scientists asked adolescent children in those cities how the bombing affected their morale. They almost unanimously replied that it did not break their spirits or the support of their country. If anything, the bombing increased the sense of community. People came to each other's rescue. And those affected were taken care of. Lindemann, however, went on and lied to Churchill that the bombing of one's home was perceived as worse than losing a loved one. Arguably, this lie caused hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths during the war. But as I said, that's a story for another day. If it didn't work in Britain, why did Brits still believe in its use overseas? Well, not only did figures like Lindemann lie about its effectiveness, British government propaganda also definitely framed this spirit of unity of humanity helping others in times of severe crisis as something unique for the British the Blitz spirit, and it united the British in the face of a fascist threat from Germany. British society didn't crumble under the explosions because the British culture was superior to others. Class differences were overcome and Britain was united in its sole martyrdom against Nazism. Or was it? Well, no. Post-war research shows that the same blitz spirit was present in other countries where strategic bombing was used in the hope to crush the people's will to fight and support their nation's war effort. In Germany, for example, researchers found that people reacted to the bombing similar to the Brits in Hull and Birmingham. It turns out you didn't have to be British to be able to withstand terror. Being human would do the trick. Gustave Le Bon, as well as the world's leaders, had hugely underestimated people's ability to be humane and selfless in times of terror. Whether it was because they projected the view of themselves on others, or because they honestly felt like other cultures were inferior to theirs, they were completely wrong when it came to strategic bombing. And that British blitz spirit, the people who transcended class differences, who even proudly celebrated their defiance of German bombs, that too is largely based on propaganda. As we've just spoken about how the British people are showing enormous courage in the face of the Blitz, but does this mean that all people are, as Churchill will one day put it, proud to be under the fire of the enemy? Are Londoners really, as filmmaker Humphrey Jennings writes to his wife, secretly delighted with the privilege of holding up to Hitler? We should be careful not to confuse the genuine stoicism of civilians with propaganda images of a unified, enthusiastic, and plucky nation facing up to the bombs with pride. In fact, a lot of evidence suggests that people are turning inwards rather than outwards to cope with the bombs. 
The British are turning towards their family, local communities, and familiar patterns of life to get through the Blitz. Rather than focus on the lofty ideal of beating the German menace, they focus on getting back to a regular and routine way of life. This is evident in a host of diaries and private letters. In one, a seamstress writes that it is because we can still live a normal life in times like these that makes the war worth winning and our winning certain. That is what morale is all about. And while a high number of people are positively coping, not all of Britain is keeping its trademark stiff upper lip. Things simply aren't as calm as the posters, newspapers, and films like to portray. There has been a brief lull in crime in 1939 and early 1940, but crimes will soar throughout the war. By the war's end, property damage defenses will rise from 305,114 in 1940 to 478,394 in 1945. Male juvenile delinquency will also increase dramatically by nearly 70%, casting some doubt on the idea that everyone is in it together. After a night of intense bombing, the Daily Express reports that the city of Coventry is keeping its courage and sanity. But home intelligence inspectors disagree, writing in their report that there were more open signs of hysteria, terror, and neurosis observed in one evening than during the whole of the past two months together in all areas. Women were seen to cry, to scream, to tremble all over, to faint in the street, to attack a fireman, and so on. The overwhelmingly dominant feeling on Friday was the feeling of utter helplessness. There were several signs of suppressed panic as darkness approached. And are the class divisions that so mark British history really melting away? Not really. At least not as much as the government liked to claim. In fact, the evacuation program has served to reinforce some very Victorian stereotypes of the urban poor. Many middle-class suburbanites avoid accepting working-class children into their homes. Many that do are contemptuous of the head lice and unsanitary habits the kids supposedly bring with them from the city. During the first wave of evacuations, letters to the editor pages and newspapers are filled with displeasure at the program. One reader in the Glasgow Herald complains of the disobedient and verminous children polluting country homes. From the other side, stories often fly in working class papers that the rich are cheating rationing regulations and regularly dining at fancy restaurants while authorities turn a blind eye. Ralph Ingersoll, an American journalist, visits Blitz London and is shocked to see how in a shelter in the Docklands, 8,000 people have to share six buckets while upper-class residents sheltered at the Dorchester Hotel in the West End enjoying Turkish baths and feather beds. So there we are. The Blitz spirit is overblown. The effectivity of strategic bombing is a hoax and human nature is better than world leaders anticipated. The British nature is not as good as British propaganda made it seem. And while this might seem like some harmless nationalist propaganda to boost morale, it had a huge impact on the remainder of the war and the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Imagine this, you have a bomber fleet of hundreds or thousands of bombers. You have two options. Either you use them to bomb factories, enemy strong points, armies, tanks, materials, supply lines, airfields, fuel depots, or you use them to again and again, night after night, bomb the civilians of the country you are fighting against. The hope to break their spirits, to get them to transcend into barbarity and rise up against their governments. The first one has a visible effect on your army's progress in beating your enemy. The second one is based on falsehoods and presumptions of your own superiority. What would you do? If you want to see our World War II weekly episode about the beginning of the London Blitz, you can click right here. Any moment now. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Justinas Yorodas. We wouldn't be making any episodes without our friends like Justinas. So do your part, sign up to the Time Ghost Army on timeghost.tv or Patreon. And remember to subscribe and press that bell.